I, I think a lot of people say, what's it like to shoot celebrities? And it's such a strange question because it's, just, it's like shooting anybody else. You, you, you have to, you, I mean, it's really nice to photograph somebody that you might know or who, whose work you might admire or respect. But the bottom line, and I think this is, from what I understand from a lot of portrait photographers, a face is a face. And I think a lot of portrait photographers, I think, I know I'm like this, just really get something out of the ability to just stare at faces and to be able to like almost be voyeuristic. Because if, if I meet you in the street and I'm starting looking around at your eyes and I'm starting to look around at your eyes and I'm looking at your nose and where your mouth is and you know how your ears are, I mean, it's weird. But it's such a safe place to do that from behind a camera. And I think, you know, both of these things, you know, the, the love of photography plus this love of like faces um, just led me to kind of photograph faces. Uh, and I think that just kind of led to, well, you know, if you're going to photograph faces and you're going to get commissioned, some of the people that you get commissioned for are actually going to be people that are known for something. So I think that's how the, the, the celebrity thing happened. But, you know, for all the celebrities, I shoot, I shoot just as many non-celebrities. Um, obviously, for audiences or people are, when I'm showing my work, I think people are obviously more interested in the celebrities. But... For me as a photographer, when I, when I take a portrait, um, you know, genuinely, I, I, I really, I get into a place where I don't care. It's just about the face. So when, when you're starting making portraits, uh, or if you want to be, or if you are a portrait photographer, listen, we all learn. Every day I learn. Every portrait I make, I learn something new. That never stops. So I think what's really important is to, you know, not to get bogged down by the cameras, not to get bogged down by the lenses, not to get bogged down by the f-stop and the settings and the lighting and all these factors. I think what's really important is to practice your communication skills with whoever you're photographing. I mean, I've certainly been in situations where somebody has said, can I take your picture? And I, yeah, okay, or it's for something or whatever. And I sit down and, you know, I do this and I'm watching people running around for lights and cameras and ref stops and I'll tweak that and tweak this and tweak that. And then the person takes a camera and just starts pointing at me and taking pictures. Uh, and I mean, yeah, they might be making a pretty picture. They might be making a creative photograph because of the lighting and, you know, some decisions they've made, but they're not getting anything from me. And to me, that, that, that's not really what portraiture is about. So, um, you know, I'm not telling you you should go in there and from a position of ignorance with your gear. I mean, know what your camera does, know what an f-stop does, you know, know how a, how a light works, but the, the, the bottom line is when you're with that person, you're going to be with them for this kind of short period of time quite often. Make it matter, you know, uh, talk to them, be a, be, be a human being and try and break it down into this two human beings having an interaction. And I think if you can really get it to that level, you'll start getting more power and from your portraits. You know, I think... I think after doing what I've been doing for how long I've been doing it, it's a long time, um, I've had the privilege to, to photograph people more than once. And it's always such a kick for me when I, when, I, when I photograph someone for a second time and there's something positive that happened the first time and they remember or they go, oh, yeah, this guy's Mark. He's fast. Let's do Mark, you know. So um, I... I Anthony Bourdain, I, I photographed three or four times. And, uh, you know, I think I started at the beginning with him. You know, he came in, he was very serious and very amazingly pleasant and amazing, but like such a, a wall of just, I don't, I mean, I know it. I don't want to be here. I don't want to be doing this. I'm doing it. Shut up, Mark, kind of thing. 
So, you know, a little bit of Scottish charm, which doesn't go that far, but a little bit of Scottish charm and chatting a bit and chatting about Scottish cuisine. And I know he'd just done an episode in Scotland and, uh, you know, he, he just, uh, he, you know, just managed to break this down a bit. And we were chatting, taking photographs. And at the end of that first time, I said, hey, next time I photograph you, you might smile for me. And he said, no, nah, it's never going to happen. And then a couple of times later, I think uh, the this, this shot that we're talking about was very close to, sadly, when uh, when he passed away. And he comes in and he goes, oh, it's Mark, or, or it's you again. I can't remember if you knew it was Mark. I said, you're going to smile for me, Mr. Bourdain? Come on, like that. And uh, he just almost cracked a smile <laughs> as he looked at me. But I know I made that happen. That wasn't that that photograph wouldn't have happened unless that I had that 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 me as a photographer had actually made it happen. So, um, and then you know, in retrospect or hindsight or however you want to look at it, I think. Uh, I think there's such a sadness in his eyes that I didn't see before, and that always kind of kind of makes me very sad to look at now. But I love the portrait, and I, I hope that anybody else that sees it might get a little feeling of who he is from from the picture, and, and that's what it's all about. Um, so this is this is a portrait of Emma Stone, and uh, she she was just. You know, it's like you, you go in to take a picture and sometimes you just have to 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 be the funny guy and do the kind of dog and pony show. But what's really important is to judge a situation because if somebody doesn't want that, you're going to feel miserably. But feeling's okay as well. I feel very often. But sometimes everything goes right and you, your humor is right and, uh, and, and you, you manage to provoke like this genuine smile with eye contact and... Um, you know, you make a portrait that, that you really like. I think the simplicity of the composition and, and, and the genuineness of her smile and laugh and look make, makes us a portrait I really like. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm super pleased, super pleased with that picture. Um, and, you know, no, not a lot of technical ability there, let's be honest, probably one light um, on a white background, probably had maybe five, six, seven minutes to get the shot and you know, you always feel good when you make it happen. So that's that. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm waiting for Al Pacino. <laughs> I'm sitting in a room waiting for Al Pacino to come in. Um, and what was so strange about this day is I was doing three por portraits that day. Um, Robert Duvall has just left the room. I've just photographed Robert Duvall, right? And I've done everything in my power to keep Robert Duvall there so I can see Robert Duvall and Al Pacino in the same room. I thought I would die and go to heaven if I am. So Duvall's talking about football, and I don't know much about football, but he likes Scottish football. He's talking about some movie he made in Scotland, and I know nothing about it, and I'm doing my absolute best to, to just try and keep him there because Pacino's coming. I'm thinking maybe if Pacino comes in the room, I can go, you guys stand together for a second. Anyway, Duvall's ushered out. And Pacino comes in and he sits down. I say, how you doing, Mr. Pacino? You doing all right? I said, yeah, I'm doing good. And I said, uh, you just miss Robert Duvall. And he goes, I just miss Robert Duvall. I can't do it, Pacino. You just miss Robert Duvall. And he did the eyes and he finished on there. I was like, click. I thought, I'm done, man. Let's move on. So that was kind of my Al Pacino experience. Badly exposed, um, horribly shot and not sharp. But I managed to make it look all right in the post-processing, you know, and that, <laughs> that's what happens. And, you know, the bottom line, and I, I, you know, you take the photograph, you get the photograph. You know, often it's fine. Sometimes if the photo gods align, you get an okay portrait or a good portrait, whatever. I mean, you know, um, you get paid, you spend the money, but you know what you get, or what I get, or, or, or what I take home with me and, I, and gets me up the next day is like that interaction with that person and that memory and that story. And nobody can ever take that away from you. And the stories I could tell about everyday people that I photograph, I have that same feeling for. And I think that as a portrait photographer, that's what that's what gets me up in the morning and that, that's what makes me want to take more portraits. 
Snoop Doggity Dog. I've photographed Snoop. I'm fortunate enough to have spent a reasonable amount of time with this man. I think I've worked with him four or five times. And uh, it's always unventilated for some reason. Wherever I am with Snoop, it always seems to be not the best ventilation. And um, this particular shoot, uh, I photographed Snoop, Method Man, Red Man, and somebody else, uh, Be Real. And uh, there was a lot of smoke in the room. And I'm not a smoker in any way, shape or form. And I was so high by the end of the day from the contact high that I physically couldn't drive my rental car to the airport in LA. And I had to get one of my assistants to do it. And, uh, you know, I look at that photo and I just honestly, it makes me shudder. I mean, I reeked um, having to go through LAX. I mean, it was just a nightmare. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't swap it for the world, and uh, I hope I get to photograph him again soon. It was just, a, just a great experience. Just, just hanging out, just hanging out with these people was just a lot of fun. Really good time. I love Gillian Anderson. I've always loved Gillian Anderson, and I was very, very excited to photograph her. And I, I was, you know, it's like I, people say, do you ever get starstruck? I'm constantly starstruck in these situations. Like, you know, you, 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 I have this kind of attempt at a cool persona. I go, oh, my God, it's Gillian Anderson. Um, and she came in and she did, I spent some time with her in here and makeup. And I said, how are you feeling? And she goes, let's do something a little, a little uh, let's throw it back a little old Hollywood that's a great idea. So, you know, put, I, I use Rotolite, so I threw this Rotolite into the shot on this side and um, kind of thing what I did on the other side. Had another, I had a fill from the front and then another little kicker from the back right. And she just got really, we put on some music that was kind of right for the, for the mood and she kind of moved through it. And I really got an opportunity to, to take photographs quietly which is not something I often do. I'm often like, da, 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 da. but the mood was really quiet and the poses were really right. And it's not a way I, I like to shoot. I like to kind of provoke it and catch moments. But sometimes, you know, you, you, it's very important that if you're sensing a mood, that, 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 that you as a photographer should go with that mood and let that be what happens. And uh, it's it's good for me to know that I don't have to be the dog and pony and the clown show all the time and sometimes just letting it happen and and, and 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 trying to capture what's going on in front of you is really important as well so as a as a photographer uh, as a portrait photographer another thing that you can practice um, when you've not got a camera in your hand is trying to sense a mood what's going on in this room um, it's a good life skill. If you're sensing a mood and you're sensing that this situation should be moving slower and you don't have to be the performing monkey, then go with that. You know, if nothing's happening, make something happen and make it happen. But if it's happening in front of you, go with it because th that's what's going to make the best picture in, the, in, in that situation. Um, sometimes, sometimes the photo gods don't align. <laughs> <laughs> Something, not, nothing aligns. So um, I photographed Jennifer Aniston, and I, I'm going to say up front, she was truly, truly lovely. She was kind. She was generous. She was everything in a human being that, that I, I would want in my, my little interaction with her. What I could not do in this portrait is break through anything. Everything that I got was her decision to give me. And that, although the portrait is fine, it's kind of pretty, it's, it's reasonably well lit, it's, I think it's almost sharp or sharpish. Um, I didn't make that picture happen. Any human being standing there with a camera would have got that pose and that photo. And to me, that was a, that was a failure. And it's weird because it's, you know, a popular picture. I've done very well from it. People know the picture. It's been used for many different things. But it's that I think it's really important for me to know that I, I, I'm not happy with how that happened. 
And I, I would know, I don't, I don't like it when that happens. And, you know, <laughs> I, I see it. I don't know if anybody else does, but she was, she was tremendous. I was just, I just didn't do well enough. I didn't, I didn't do what I had to do to, to make the portrait I wanted to, to make. It's important um, to do a little preparation um, before you go in to make a portrait. It's really nice to have something to talk about. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, you should say, oh man, I loved you in that movie, but just something going on that maybe you've has shown a little effort on your side to find out something about that person or, you know, know one of their interests. I mean, it's not hard to do. We got a lot of resources. Um, and I, I had read somewhere about something with Krasinski and Hemingway. I can't even remember what it was now. And I thought, you know what, I, I'm going to try and do some kind of Hemingway type feel with this picture or something. Um, and I knew he had a beard because they, they had told me he had a beard. And the stylist kind of said to me, well, what do you want him to wear? And I really wanted to go like a big heavy fisherman's jumper <laughs> sweater, but, you know, uh, that didn't happen. But he did, they, they did find this kind of sweater that had, I think I said, I, you know, I, I'm, 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 I'm knowing I'm not getting that, but I think I asked for something with texture or like wool or something. And he came in like this and, you know, I had this vision of a photograph in my head. I wanted that side light. I wanted dark to light. I wanted the eyes dark. I wanted a hit on the hair. And when it actually happens in front of you, <laughs> wow, I kind of did that. <laughs> and, and, and that to me is the exact opposite feeling of the one before, which was the, uh, uh, didn't happen for me. And he was brilliant. And I, I love this photo because it was, a, it was, a, it was something I planned to do. Um, and a lot of the time on the spot, you change your plans because it's not working how you want it to work. Um, so when you actually come away with something, you go, yeah, I planned that. I, I saw that in my head before it happened. I actually feel like, you know, for that three seconds, I kind of know what I'm doing until I like a trip over a cable and knock the light off or something. But for that moment, when that came up on the screen, I, I felt pretty good with myself. Photography has changed so much. It changes so much all the time. But w when I started shooting, I would shoot on film. Um, I had very little choices of what to do. Choose your ISO, shot a lot of strobes, so it was shutter speed was set, 125 or whatever. And I had very little choices in camera functions and stuff. What my favorite thing about shooting film was, was that you actually got like a physical break you know, you would send your film to the lab. If it was being rushed, you might get contact sheets 24 hours later. And, um, you know, you, you had this mental break. I mean, don't don't get me wrong, I say a break. I mean, the anguish that you were feeling about, oh, has everything come out? It was a nightmare, you know. You'd shot like eight or 10 uh, Polaroids and the client loved them. And you're just, you know, gosh, I hope I got something that even looks remotely like this Polaroid on film. and. You know, but it was it was a mental break. So when your when your film came back, you were um, you know it was nice to look at and see what happened most of the time. When we went into more of the digital world and we went into tethering, where everything was coming up in front of the client immediately, you know, or in front of whoever immediately your talent, whoever it was, um, it was tricky because. Right in the beginning, you know, that you were using just the, the apps or the, the programs that were transferring were not, you know, it's hard to do a color correction. You were seeing a raw file, uh, you know, it was slow, it was dropping, it was a problem. Um, and I think one of the things that it really frustrated me because it stopped my flow of work because people are looking at a monitor, whereas before they couldn't look into my film. And one of the things that's really helped that is working with Dell because I don't really know too much about computers or monitors or anything. What I do know is that if I'm on set, I need that computer to show that photo and I need that monitor to show it how it's supposed to look. Um, and that is what I need. And, and just from the experience of working with their tools, the precision tools, it's not a worry for me. 
You know, I'm not constantly panicking about how does this look or, you know, am I 50 frames behind because of some buffer or something. And, and, and as not a technical person, it really, really, really helps me to just have tools that work. And Dell's really been that for me. And um, I, I, I enjoy them. I've even actually started to do things on computers I never did before. So it's been, it's, it, it, as far as computers go and cameras and photography, the more they can stay out your way and let you be creative and let you do what you do and not mess with your workflow or mess with a shoot, then that's, that's what you need. The best way to get better at what you do with anything is practice. Um, and I practice taking photographs all the time. I practice taking photographs when I don't have a camera in my hand because I practice the relationship that I, you know, I go into the market to buy something. I'm going to talk to that person. I'm going to look at them. I'm going to see how they react. I'm going to try and see how their face moves, what makes them smile, what makes them frown, what gets their attention. And I think as a portrait photographer, that is absolutely essential. Um, try out a different light one day, you know, try something new to play around, push the boundaries, push, push everything you're trying to do. But you have to practice even on these days. And I have them a lot where it's like, oh, I just don't want to have to think about that today. Get out and make some photographs. Take, take some portraits, start with the people you have access to. I mean, if you look at some of, like, for me, uh, Linda McCartney created some of the most incredible photos of the Beatles and other bands and the Stones that I've ever seen, right? And she had, she had access, she put herself there, she became part of that scene. And like it was just Linda with a camera and nobody noticed her. So, you know, work, work with people you have access to. If you've got a, a, a friend that's kind of doing interesting work as a hairdresser, you know, say, hey, can I take some pictures of the people you're working with? If you're in a music scene, photograph the people in your music scene. If none of that appeals to you, photograph your family. I guarantee you've got like some crazy uncle and he's going to be an incredible subject to photograph. So practice your craft. That's, that's the way you get better. I swear I do it every day and occasionally I get a little better. I mean, I love going to other places, but it's not, it's not New York. Oh, yeah. And I always, I, I, I swoon when I come home. I look out the window. I see uh, Manhattan from the north. Oh, yeah. You know, we, we, we all know that. And right. uh, I always want to come home, you know, no matter where I am. And it's my city. And again, it's such an honor to be considered a real New Yorker. Right. I was blessed. I had a... Uh, one of the top chefs on uh, the Food Network uh, referred to me as an icon the other day. Yeah, and, uh, you know. What? I, I have to be honest, I was, I was, I was, I couldn't imagine a better honor. It was like getting the Oscar. Yeah. When when I saw you today, when you walked in, I go, oh, I know that guy. Uh, you know what I mean? I'd like, and it is, yeah. it's really iconic. And and the look that you portray is really iconic, New York. And yeah, yeah it's really cool, wants, right? what we're trying to do here and i'm going to blow it all by talking about it but i'm trying to take photos during a conversation and why i'm trying to do that is because if i do that i'm going to get things that are actually genuine reactions so i've probably messed it all up now but let's keep chatting because it's good to hear anyway oh, it's really so, a pleasure, man. so your kids your kids were born in the city Yes, both of them. My son was born in uh, St. Vincent's with oh, wow. condos. Yeah, it's gone, right? Right, that yeah. quickly. Yeah. But I will tell you something funny. I took my uh, camera in there. I have a, a Dave Dave Brummer over there sold me my first and only camera. Right. I'm very loyal to it. It's, what is it? It's a Canon Elon. Oh. <laughs> from like 19, what year is it, Dave? I don't even remember. But people tell me all the time, I'll oh, get a bigger bike, get a no, bigger no, bike. No, 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 no. Elon. Yeah. I adore it. But when my son was born, I photographed the whole thing, but I have a wonderful photo of his mother in full throws and out the, the right side of the frame is the 
the Empire State Building out the window. Uh, that's a beautiful New York moment. I mean, that really is. I love what you're doing with that. Can I ask you, I'll tell you something really nice. Two things are really nice. Photos look brilliant, number one. Um, the, the chair you're sitting on, when I went to the White House to photograph Obama, I thought, you know what? I'm not going to use some piece of White House furniture. I, I want to have a chair that the president sat on. Right. So I bought this uh, stool. So amazing. it's really, really nice feeling to know that you're yeah. you're saying right. you, you, yeah. Right. yeah. But then I've used it. I've used it a lot ever since. I photographed Tiger Woods on it recently. I thought, oh, that's great, man. That's beautiful. Photographed uh, Michael Douglas on it. Uh, just a lot of people have just like. So on this chair, You're it's kind of nice. To get That's fabulous, man. Ass on the chair. I'm not. I, you know what? I'll do a lot of things. I'll do a lot of things, Sparks. But your ass is not something I'm <laughs> photographing. That's excellent. Excellent. Thank you, man. I appreciate Thank you. you that was brilliant. Stoked. Thank you very, very much. So I think I think you know that that was a prime example of like how easy photography can be. I had a, somebody who looks brilliant. It's got a great look. Is you know has great stories, has great eye expressions, and you know I think one of the things I'd like to just mention is that I hope people notice is that a lot of the time when I'm shooting and not when I'm talking, my camera's right here, and the reason I do that is so when I do that, people don't go like that, right? Because they they get used to a sense of you know having your camera in your hand in front of you and it being part of you and being part of the thing. Uh, super quick, if anyone's interested, this is a. Uh, uh, LED light. I can't remember who makes them, but I'm sure you can get one in B and H. Um, I have one other uh, Roth light on the back there, just giving a little kick. And this is a Leica SL2. And the thing which was brilliant today and is always brilliant is how great the images look for anybody that wants to see them on set. And uh, thanks to Dell for not having any problems with that, which is, as I said, the most important thing not letting your technology get in your way of your creative process and things just work. Thanks very much.